My name is Heather Cox Richardson. I am a professor of history, but I do not represent my employer and I do not speak for my employer when I do these videos. Evanston, Illinois, that's a fun place as well. Um, my son lives in Evanston. All right, and Chicago. All right, uh, so um, let me get right down to the questions you've asked. And let's just say there are a lot of really good ones here today, and I don't have any specific order or specific plan, um, although I do want to end up in a certain place. So uh, somebody asked a really good question, and that is, why on earth don't we hear about the children at the border any longer? That's a great question, because there are still, in fact, children in Health and Human Services. Uh, for the first time, the numbers have fallen under 10,000, I believe, but you don't hear a lot about them for a couple of reasons, and let me walk you through what they are. The first is something that has me terribly concerned, and that is that people like Hungary's let me actually just step an even bigger step back and say, as you know, we are at a point in global history where democracy, which has seemed as if it was the dominant ideology in the world coming out of least since the Cold War and probably since World War II, um, really people, certainly in Western democracies, and by Western, I mean people who share an ideology, not necessarily a piece of geography, um, or developed countries is maybe a better way to think about it. Um, believed that they that this was going to spread across the globe over time and become the dominant ideology around the globe and in fact the opposite seems right now to be happening that democracies are on the ropes and autocracy is rising and one of the reasons i'm concerned about the way we talk about immigration is because autocracies um, that is uh, uh, governments that are led by a single person um, have tended to uh, in in the modern era to have gained their support by complaining about immigrants. And Viktor Orban is a great example of this, somebody who convinced his people that they were under siege, if you will, by immigrants coming into his country. And therefore, they needed to back him who would stand against those immigrants. And Donald Trump's use of immigration as a centerpiece of his run for the presidency in 2016 made me very, very concerned because of the way he talked about immigration. As you know, we are a nation of immigrants. We have always been a nation of immigrants, and I'm just there between the nation of the United States of America and the continent of North America, which was um, not a nation of immigrants until immigrants began to arrive in the 1490s. Of course, there was a large population of indigenous Americans who had lived here for tens of thousands of years without immigration. That's another story. But we, so the United States of America has always been a nation of immigrants. And one of the reasons, of course, we're in such deep, you know, horse hockey right now uh, in terms of inflation and in terms of uh, employment is because there just aren't enough people to do the work that needs to be done, in part because our, in, our, in, our immigration has been so cut off for a number of years. So let me go back again now to immigration and what happened under the Trump years. When he talked about the how terrible immigration was, and I'm not going to give you, I've done a whole episode at least, if not a series, on immigration and how the immigration laws changed dramatically in the, in the 20th century, in 1924, for example, and in 1965, and how all those changes matter in terms of who came to America and how many people came to America. But we're in a special place now because of Trump's determination to shut off immigration. And what was interesting about that was, did you notice it was fuzzy? Like there were times he talked about immigrants from Mexico being rapists and criminals. And then all of a sudden, somehow they were terrorists who bombed things. And that then all of a sudden they were from the Middle East. And there was really a lot of fuzziness about what he meant when he talked about immigrants. And that's in part a reflection of the fact it was an attempt to use that idea of an other rhetorically as if they are somehow uh, lesser human beings. So they the Trump administration tried before the COVID pandemic to stop immigration to America, but that's really dicey because we know in American history all along we have needed migrant labor, especially in order for, for our industries to run, especially our agricultural industry. So as early as the 1870s, you've got immigrants working the sugar beet industry, for example, in the Midwest. And that's just been absolutely part of our agribusiness. And it's always really been agribusiness in the West since the very beginning of there being agribusiness in the West. And that continues. We need more seasonal workers than we, we have within the United States of America. So there has been a long tradition of seasonal workers coming to America. Now, there's a number of law changes that make that, that criminalize that. 
in the 1960s. And that's one of the things that people like Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush wanted to fix is the disconnect between the number of people who were allowed over the border and the number of workers that were actually needed within the border. So there used to be in the 1980s and the 1990s and early in the aughts, um, uh, this focus on people, his, largely Hispanic workers coming across the border in order to work in order to, they were economic migrants. Those have actually been declining for a long time in America and they don't tend to be Mexicans. They, um, those people, uh, Mexicans who have lived here in America uh, is it, with an undocumented status for fewer than five years is actually very, very low. More Mexicans tend to go the other direction than come over the border. What we've had for a while now are refugees. And I wanna make that distinction really important and you'll see why in a second. And that's that, by international law, countries have to allow people to apply for asylum from war-torn countries, places where their lives are in danger, etc. Refugees cannot be turned away in the process of application. That is, they're supposed to be allowed to apply for ref refuge. That doesn't mean they're going to get it, but they have to apply. That's what Trump was trying to get rid of. The the. Well, he talked about them as undocumented workers trying to uh, undocumented workers trying to come in and steal American jobs or whatever. The vast majority of the people trying to get in, he was trying to stop, were refugees. Now they weren't necessarily coming through checkpoints because they the administration made that so difficult. But they were people who wanted to apply for, for to apply for asylum, and those are the ones that Trump pulled away from their children. Those were the children that he 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 pulled aside from the parents and the idea was to deter parents from trying to apply for asylum at all. Okay, so that's what happened there. Then during the Trump administration, uh, we got, of course, the COVID, um, the coronavirus pandemic. And then under a CDC, a Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, directive called, uh, called for, uh, 42, um, something 42, I'm drawing a blank on the first word. Um, I have it written down here, whatever, um, order 42 or something. Um, the CDC said, we're not going to let anybody over this border because of a disease. And that's a different thing that says, it doesn't say this is a policy about who can come in or anything else, except because there is a lockdown across the world, we're locking down this border and nobody can come in. Biden gets elected and all of a sudden all sorts of people who thought that Trump was horrible say, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to be able to make it across the border now. And a lot of those people were encouraged by immigrant brokers, immigrant smugglers, criminals, whatever, across the border saying, yes, you can come into America now. And that's why Vice President Harris kept saying, don't try to come. We have not changed the rules. You know, this is not this is not suddenly an open border. And of course, the Republicans around America were running around going open border, open border, open border. And it was not an open border that for uh, the, the order of the the order 42 was still in place saying because of the CDC you can't come in now as of May 23rd of this year the Biden administration is going to get rid of 42 which puts us back to where we were and this is why you're suddenly seeing things like Ron DeSantis for a uh, governor of Florida and Greg uh, Abbott of Texas um, doing these incredible stunts about how suddenly there are tons of immigrants flooding the border. Now, there's a couple things about that as well. The Biden administration had very, very high numbers of interceptions of people coming across the border, but many of those were people who were caught and then get, and then and then sent back to um, to the border and then kept coming, and so they were counted a number of times. But back to the children. In fact, what the Biden administration did was it said, listen, we're not letting people across this border, but we will not return unaccompanied children. So if children were unaccompanied under the Biden administration when they came to the border, the Biden administration began to process them, let them into the country and began to process them. That's why there was that huge surge. So, you know, if you can't get in as a family, send your kids over because they at least will be across the border. And that created um, the, that huge t first surge of children under the Biden administration where they were supposed to be processed by Customs and Border Patrol in, I think it's 72 hours. I'm doing this all from memory. And some of them were there as many as 76 hours. And then they were channeled into Health and Human Services. Health and Human Services is supposed to find um, their family members here in the United States.
United States or some sort of sponsorship, and, and then they will be released until they go back to court. This is not like you never hear from them again. They go back to court and determine what their status really should be. And um, the under the since COVID, uh, a number of those children, as I say, I think the number now is around 9,200. I don't know. Uh, don't quote me on that. But there's a lot of them are are in Health and Human Services, and they have not found sponsors for them. So the Biden administration does, in fact, have a number of children still in Health and Human Services, and they're not in great conditions. I mean, quite frankly, they're they're in barracks. Some of them are in in tent cities, and they're a terribly vulnerable population in terms of their ages, in terms of their stability. They are now without families and they're in these uh, you know, substandard government facilities. It's not an okay thing. Um, but I, I thought that was a great question and that's about the best I can, um, can, uh, can throw at that. If you are still concerned about the children at the border, that's something that the, the issues with our immigration policy are very much still issues and they frustrate the bananas out of me because um, the, as you probably know, when John Boehner was Speaker of the House a while back, in fact, there was a bipartisan answer to our immigration issues that came out of the Senate at the time. And Boehner would not bring it to the floor for a vote because he knew that it was going to pass and it would take away this issue of immigration as a viable way to rally voters um, against the Democratic Party. And, you know, there we have problems. We, we, we literally need more workers than can come in across the border. So that creates a vacuum system. There's all kinds of things that are problematic. There are solutions. There are solutions that the Senate has has actually done before, but couldn't get it to a vote in the House of Representatives, and here we sit. And that is not a partisan. Um, the use of immigration as an as an um, as a, a, a political cudgel is in fact partisan. But the problems with immigration have had a number of bipartisan solutions because if you're really willing to look at the issues. You know, there are issues that are actually really quite solvable, and we have a lot of experience solving those. It's not happening in part because of the recalcitrance of the Republicans and the realization that they can use it as a political football and, you know, to hell with the people who are hurt by it. So um, so that's the question of the children at the border, which I was I was happy to see because we I feel like that's a thread that got lost. All right. So. Um, uh, and that's why you're hearing so much now all of a sudden from people like um, Greg Abbott about, you know, how how Biden is swamping the border again. In fact, the 40, uh, um, Order 42 is still in place. It will be in place until May 23rd. This is absolutely an attempt for um, Abbott to draw attention away from his many failures as a governor. You know, of course, he was responsible not only for the grid falling apart um, that froze and killed a number of Texans last year, but in, in testimony earlier this spring, one of the people, somebody in court said, yeah, w w the, the people who were in charge of the Texas grid have been lambasted for keeping prices as high as they were. And they said, we did it under direct order of Greg Abbott. And that's the day that Greg Abbott promptly said, oh, let's go to war against trans people. And now, of course, he's done this whole thing by closing the Mexican border, uh, again, with the idea it's going to be some way to stop immigration. And it's clearly just a political ploy. And that has cost billions of dollars and and lots of people who were previously avid supporters are really angry about that so i think that's why why you're hearing so much about it and you're going to hear more about it all right um listen people are complaining about oh somebody's got the name here um title 42 that's it people are complaining about the the quality of the stream um, I will do the best I can here. I live in the woods. This is why we need broadband. Um, and I will, you know, when I'm in hotels or in Boston, it works. Otherwise, I am told it shows up just fine if you want to watch later. So I'm sorry about that. It is what it is. All right. Um, a couple more questions here then. Um, people, the easy questions I'll get rid of first. Is there any hope of resurrecting the fairness doctrine and having it applied to cable TV news and individual anchor shows? No. There is no hope of resurrecting the Fairness Doctrine for this reason. The Fairness Doctrine was attached to public licenses. You no longer need a public license. So, for example, I don't have a public license. I mean, how on earth would they apply the Fairness Doctrine to me, for example? So that is not an option. But do not lose hope because, I, and I'm actually a huge believer in the First Amendment. 
the problem that we are in right now is not because of the First Amendment. The problem that we're in right now is because social media has permitted two things. Social media has permitted the false amplification of lies basically. And you think about it, we always had the craziness. It was just in the newspaper tabloids when you went to the checkout counter and you looked at Bat Boy or whatever and you laughed and you went on by. Some people, and I knew somebody who used to read those and really believe those, but that noise didn't go far enough to cause any damage really to our democracy. The problem now is that the person who owns the Bat Boy story, and I made that story up, uh, can go onto social media and artificially amplify it again and again and again and again. So you hear, for example, remember during the pandemic, because, and I remember it because probably more than 20,000 people sent it to me, a video about the pandemic that blamed Dr. Anthony Fauci for the pandemic. It was complete crap if you know what you're looking at. So I didn't have to look beyond the introduction of the two characters to say there is nobody here who has any authority or evidence. But because I'm trained in a different way than other people are, people really believe that. They're like, is this really true? And the answer is no. And that got the kind of mileage it did because of the ability of social media platforms to multiply lies. So I look at the, the, that multiplication and I say, you know, people can say whatever they want. What they shouldn't be able to do is use public platforms artificially. So what do you do to, to adjust that? You adjust the algorithms. There's a new article in The Atlantic this week, I think it is, that talks about how Facebook used to just be, here's something, here's something, here's something that was in chronological order. Now, of course, you can aggregate what people are interested in seeing and you can give it a value for shock, a value for creating anger or emotional engagement, as Facebook does. And you can make people see that again and again and again. You can also privilege advertising. So, for example, a number of people complain that they want to see my posts first, including my my fiance, and he can't find them. He doesn't get them. I suspect that that's not because they're trying to silence me because of what I say. I suspect it's because I refuse advertising. In case you hadn't noticed, there's never advertising on my page. I get probably six or seven you know, requests a day for advertising on that page, and I always say no. And I think they're like, well, why should we let anybody see her stuff if she won't sell advertising on the page? So um, I, I think as a government or as a country, we could say, sure, you can say whatever you want on whatever your show is, but you can't artificially amplify it, that, that you can't privilege certain voices over others. And I, that's not prohibited in any way that I can see by the Constitution. So there is that issue in terms of amplification and of um, the skewing of our, uh, uh, our, our public um, discourse. And there's another one that I was going to tell you, and now I can't remember it. So if I remember it, I will come back to it. Um, public am amplification on social media and um, I don't know. I'll come back to the other one. All right. So, so that's not going to happen, but there is that option of focusing on uh, the means of amplification uh, through bots, through trolls, and certainly the Biden administration is working very hard on cutting back on, um, on the, the uh, use of social media by other countries, Russia, for example, and Iran to try and convince us of things that are not true. All right, so that is one of them. Uh, people ask what a shadow docket is. This is a great, great question. The shadow docket, and I'm not the expert on this. There are other people who are. I read the people who are. The shadow docket is really interesting because it's one of those things, and I, if I have time, and I think I do because I'm hyper and I'm talking fast today, that, that people didn't pay attention to, and then it turns out to be really important. The shadow docket is simply this. The Supreme Court, which, by the way, has not grown since 1869 and has a, a lot of business. Not clear. And if you know what the answer is going to be, the Supreme Court doesn't need to take it. So to get 
you know, lots of people challenge things all the way to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court's like, nah, we don't need to look at that. That's answered by this case, or this is not an interesting case. It's not an important case, whatever. And there's a lot of that they don't take. When they do take a course, they have, they hear arguments about it. They have oral arguments that are really fairly short and lawyers prepare for many arguments. Lawyers prepare long, detailed briefs. And these are really interesting reading if anybody's interested in that because they go through, well, here's this concept. This is the way they thought about it in 1811, but then it was revised in 1815. And then no one paid any attention to it until 1869. And then in 1869, there was a fight over it. It's actually sort of especially conversation about what they think about it and then they their clerks write briefs for the right decisions on or dissents from the decision of how they're going to vote on it and or how they're going to decide that case and that's the way it's supposed to happen so they hand down a decision and the way it's handed down is interesting too because the the biggest cases are saved for the more senior justices um, so it's always interesting to see who's going, you know, what comes out in each day. So the biggest cases are left for the end of a session. All right. So when the decision comes out, it, it says, this is why we believe what we believe, or this is why we dissent. And here it matter and here are the principles that we think matter so that if you're a judge somewhere you can say well in a, a, a similar case comes in front of you you can say well I'm going to decide it this way because there's this this precedent there's this idea all right but every once in a while somebody goes to the Supreme Court because they have uh, there's a major issue at stake the right to abortion for example a major issue at stake and and a judge has handed down a decision that they don't like and they want that decision stopped until it can be argued. And generally those uh, were very rare and they were not necessarily very complicated. It, it, it was just sort of like, yeah, we're going to ask and we're going to stop the slow this down until we can have an actual argument. Under this new Supreme Court, they've been using that and there's not a there's not an argument. There's there are not no briefs. There's no decision. Um, the court just says, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and let you have a break on this until the arguments are heard or whatever. Under this Supreme Court, they are increasingly using the so-called shadow docket to make major changes in the law. But the, there's a number of problems with that. First of all, we don't have any idea why they're making the decisions they are. They don't have to justify them. There's no briefing. There's no oral argument, so we don't, you know, often there are really good court reporters who are or, or, um, court journalists who watch the the arguments and they're like, oh, oh, you can see somebody's really cares about that point and that because this goes to their decision in 1987 on whatever. That's way out of my ken, but we don't have any of that and we don't have a decision. So we don't know, the lower courts have no way to know how to interpret what they've heard. And it's a real problem because rather than having any idea that the law is actually evolving based on argument, it looks really arbitrary. So that's why people are concerned about the shadow docket. And there's a new book coming out about the shadow docket and there's a number of articles online about it. All right, now to go to some of the other larger pieces that are much more in my, um, oh, somebody's asked about this one more thing about um, um, about the the federal justice, who, federal judge, I'm sorry, yesterday who um, claimed that the Centers for Disease Control had no ability to require masks on public transportation. Um, and, you know, she's uh, very, very young. She's never tried, had never tried a case. She was basically fresh out of law school when Trump made her a federal judge after he had already lost the election, when they were slamming judges into place. The American Bar Association judged that she was not qualified for the job. And um, the, the question is, is the Biden administration going to challenge that? And the answer is, well, first of all, I don't know. But second of all, kind I would kind of be surprised because today is April 19th and that CDC rule was supposed to expire on May 3rd anyway. And, you know, so it, you know, in a, in a little bit, it's moot, but um, the question that, the, what I think is interesting about the unmasking suddenly is first of all, the politicization. I've talked about that in the past, which is to my mind, just as I say, bananas, but um, 
the, the actual numbers are really interesting. And the New York Times today has done something that I've been waiting for for a very long time. And that is, as you know, the numbers of infections for COVID-19 are, are climbing again. They're climbing pretty dramatically, especially I think in rural areas. I can't remember, don't quote me on that. Um, but the hospitalizations and deaths are staying quite low. They're actually declining. Um, the deaths are about 500 a day, and they are overwhelmingly within the unvaccinated population. So right now, according to that article, according to that article, I am not a doctor. This is just according to that article. By the way, though, somebody wrote to me about something I'd written about um, COVID-19. Just so you know, I don't make that up. I, I run all everything that I want to say about uh, the coronavirus pandemic and and diabetes in that case, I run by um, somebody who used to be the CDC director of a state. So um, I try and make it accurate, but I, I'm not medically trained in any way, let me tell you. Anyway, so um, uh, according to that article in the New York Times, the current current rate of death from the coronavirus pandemic is um, uh, high, uh, lower than during a mild influenza epidemic and higher than during, uh, uh, I have to have that backward. It's in between, between a mild um, influenza uh, season and a hard influenza season. So it's kind of right in the middle there. Now, all that being said, um, there, there's a number of reasons for that. More people are vaccinated, more people have had some version of the disease, so there's at least some growing herd immunity, and, um, and also we have better drugs to fight uh, the coronavirus. Now, all that being said, the piece that I find kind of mind-blowing is that uh, by refusing to mask in public places, Americans are essentially consigning uh, immunocompromised or our disabled neighbors to a non-public -ex non existence. And I don't feel like we highlight that enough. That, um, that, you know, I always wear my mask in public for many reasons. I'm not at all really concerned about the disease myself, but I have so many immunocompromised friends and neighbors. I, I, I just, uh, it just, to me, it, it's, it is not necessarily a surprise, but certainly for me an issue that it is public policy now to say, we don't care that our immunocompromised neighbors can't really go anywhere on um, public transportation. Um, so that I think is maybe something we should reintroduce to the conversation. That's just me. Um, and But I thought that was really, really surprising yesterday that people actually said on airplanes, you can take your masks off. And I'm thinking, if I were immunocompromised and I had just dared to get on a plane and I'm flying over Toledo and they said to everybody else, take your masks off, I I would have jumped out a window, I think. But again, just me. So, um, all right. So now let me get into um, um, some of the things that I know better. Most of that stuff was not sort of my area of expertise. All right. So um, child, children of detention. Okay. So um, many the, the real question that people are asking about is, um, are we ever going to come back from our apparent march toward um, oligarchy, or in this case, autocracy? And I have really strong feelings about that. And, and you've asked, what have we done before? Have we ever been in a situation like this when our uh, members of our government have allied themselves with foreign oligarchs? or foreign autocrats, as, for example, the um, uh, CPAC, uh, conservative, uh, CPAC, I'm sorry, uh, the conservative branch uh, of the uh, political um, action committee, um, has aligned itself with uh, Viktor Orban, who um, has aligned himself with Vladimir Putin. And the answer to that is not really in the sense that the 21st century has the world much more globally um, intertwined than it was before that. But sure, this looks very much like the 1850s. And the you know at the time, people tend to forget that when the um, 
Southern elite slaveholders, and they were the ones who had, who were the, you know, the one, the one percent, or fewer than one percent in the American South. People again tend to forget that not only was the black population of the South impoverished because it was enslaved, much of the white population of the South was impoverished as well because they'd been forced off their land by elite enslavers. Um, and they, those enslavers wanted to control the American government for sure, but they also firmly believed that they were part, they were going to lead a world movement of uh, an oligarchy, that they were, they had really finally figured out what the world should be. And that was people like them running the, the world while people like me and a lot of you, I suspect, and certainly our black and brown friends and um, and Asian friends and all that acted as as workers, as ser as serfs, as servants to them. They really believed that, and a lot, and they and they convinced a lot of Americans whose voting Americans, whose which would be white men, whose livelihoods and lives were badly cramped by that vision to vote for them in part by insisting that if they didn't they would be forced into some form of equality with black americans or brown americans or indigenous americans and there was even a little talk about women but not a lot of it and you know enough white men thought that they you know that they wanted to be part of that whole white project that they agreed with those enslavers and were willing to go along with it for a very long time now that was some of them, but a lot of Americans just looked the other way. They just were like, I'm, you know, it's the 1840s, it's the 1850s, I got my farm, I'm moving west across the Erie Canal, I'm going to Minnesota, I'm going to grow wheat, things are going to be great, and I don't really care what's happening in Washington. And one of the reasons I emphasize Lincoln as much as I do is because he got it. He recognized after 1854, and in 1854 there's this crucial moment where Congress, under enormous pressure from the president, who is um, uh, sort of uh, ideologically in line with the enslavers, passes a law called the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which says that enslavers can move their enslaved property, as it would be at the time, into the American West. And the reason that matters is twofold. First of all, because it means that poor white men are not going to be able to move into that western land because they're not they're, the land's going to get monopolized but second of all it means that once there's enslaved um, uh, once there are enslaved people in that western land the federal government has to protect property so it's going to have to protect enslavement and as those different lands come into the United States as states Colorado um, I'm making up states here Colorado Wyoming the Dakotas, all that, they will be slave states. And that will mean that the entire Congress is going to be dominated by enslavers. They're, the White House is going to be dominated by enslavers. The Supreme Court already was dominated by enslavers. And the entire country was going to become one that was dominated by an oligarchy. And a lot of Northerners who could not care less about their black neighbors or black enslaved people in the South or Mexican Americans or Asian Americans or the Irish in Boston looked at that situation and said, wait a minute, if the rich guys take everything, what am I going to get? And that's the moment after 1854 when Abraham Lincoln started to talk about what America meant and what democracy meant. And people made fun of him and people called him, uh, I mean, he wasn't alone, by the way, he was actually fairly late to the game. But people said, oh, you're just, you know, you're, you're a radical um, leveler, you're, uh, you know, you're just uh, uh, an epithet. You can think of a lover, all that sort of thing. And he kept saying, listen, what America is about is equality. That's what's in the Declaration of Independence. And he kept hammering on that, and gradually people started to listen. And the more that the time ran out, the more people listened. Until finally, in 1860, when the Democrats, who were the people who dominated the, um, the, the South and were dominated by the large enslavers, went to hold their convention, it split. People forget that. Like we had the deep Southerners who wanted the federal government to protect enslavement in the territories. But the Democratic Party split and half of it went for a Northern Democrat who still was like, oh, we don't like black people in this party, but we sure don't want the 
country to be run by an oligarchy. And then there was a fourth party that, that said, stop it, all of you. We just want to go back to the way the world was before the South tried to move into the West. And then there was Lincoln and the Republican Party, which said, no, this country is supposed to be about equality. And Lincoln wins that election by a plurality, by about 42 percent of the vote off the top of my head. But it's enough to win. Crucially, he was not anywhere on the ballot in any of the southern states. So he manages to do it even without being on the ballot in the southern states. So why do I lay that out? And why do you, when you say, have we ever been in a position like this before? Do I, I talk about Lincoln? And the reason for that, and the, Repu the early Republican Party, and the reason for that is that I really believe, as you know, if you heard me, that the way you change politics is you change the way people think. And the way you change people think is you change the way you talk about politics. So, for example, one of the things that a number of you have called out was what Senator McMorrow of Michigan did today when she stood up on the floor and said, I'm not going to back down from you people any longer. You are hateful. This is not what America stands for. And it's the that speech is going viral. There was another man, I think, in um, Missouri who called out his nice um, co uh, co representatives in that state legislature and said, you know, you people tortured me as a young LGBTQ man, and I'm not going to put up with it any longer. That's why I wrote the piece I did the other day about uh, democracy being a moral position. It is a moral position. And that's what Lincoln started to say, you know, stop it. It's not that, you know, it, none of this matters. It's not a question just about going ahead. It's about what this country stands for. And and so when people say, have we ever been here before? Yes. And I think that offers us a blueprint for how we get out of where we are. That is increasingly speaking up and pushing back against the, the crap that we're hearing out there. Now, a great example of this is Ron DeSantis recently insisting that a number of math mathematics books are um, what he says full of CRT. Although, um, and that would be assumed to be critical race theory, uh, which is, as you know, a legal theory that is taught at, at, at the law school, upper law, level of law schools. Um, it, of course, it's not in a K through five math textbook. And when charged with saying, you know, what are you talking about there? Nobody has produced any kind of an example at all about what that might be. If it were me doing that story, by the way, I would look and see what they are trying to replace those textbooks with. I suspect there is uh, somebody who's suddenly going to make a lot of money on textbooks in Florida would be my guess. Just a guess. Uh, you know me, I like to follow the money. Um, but the, the truth is that in a, a democracy, that reasoned argument based in fact um, is very powerful. And, re, you know, this is one of the reasons that people like me have been frustrated with a number of mainstream media outlets that aren't pushing back on any of the stories that are really problematic. So, for example, we know that Senator Mike Lee, um, uh, a Republican senator, uh, was quite deeply involved in trying to overturn the election. We now have emails from him, messages from him, I'm sorry, not emails, messages between him and, um, and Mark Meadows, former chief of staff of, for Donald Trump, in which they're plotting to overthrow the election. And on the Sunday talk shows, nobody mentioned them. I mean, this is like mind boggling to somebody like me. That is literally a defining moment for an entire administration in any time but the present. And nobody even talked about it. So, um, so a lot of what matters in this moment, I think, is pushing back, is, is, is demanding that ma multimedia, um, I'm sorry, that mainstream media calls these things out and actually does their job. But I would also say something else. And that is that you people write to me all the time going, why is nobody pushing back on this? And I'm like, literally, there are right today, I haven't looked at the numbers, but there's probably 3000 of you listening here, I'll check. Yeah, there's about there's about 4000 of you listening right now. And the number will go will go way up. Um, that's a lot of voices. And remember, when you cast votes, for example, Mitch McConnell's one vote, there, there are 4,000 people right now, any two of whom can outvote Mitch McConnell. And 
you have voices as well. And in fact, when people complain about the mainstream media, um, it's kind of a truism in, in this business that Twitter's lovely, but you don't really convince people to do much on Twitter. Um, the, I use it for ideas, but for example, if you link a story on Twitter, virtually nobody ever clicks on it. You know who clicks on stuff? It's Facebook. So if you, and, and probably TikTok, I don't use that. Um, but if you want to spread ideas, you know, if everybody brings two people or even one person, you've, you've made a difference because you and your friend can outvote, you know, the, the person next door. And so changing that political conversation is incredibly important. And do I think it matters that Senator McMorrow spoke up? Yes, I do. And the reason I think it does is because if you listened to Alex Vin, Alexander Vindman in, in, um, Trump's first impeachment trial when he said here right matters and he gave that story about how he tell, told his dad don't worry here right matters if you listen to that it was a wonderful he was principled he was lovely and then after that Adam Schiff did the same thing in his summary and since then it's become cooler and cooler to stand up and say yeah I believe in these things now I want to add to that that doesn't mean you agree with everything that President Biden does if you agree with everything that your elected officials do, you are almost certainly not looking at them critically. And the whole point of democracy is disagreeing with people and saying, you know, he's really aced X, but I'm not keen on Y. And, um, and that's fine. What you really want to look for in a leader is, do they have the same principles that I do? Do they have the same vision for this country that I do? And then sometimes you look what they do and you think, what, what, what on earth was that about? Dude, come on. That's fine. That beats saying, oh, my person is the best thing ever and never makes a mistake um, because that says you're not looking critically at all. So that doesn't mean you have to fall in love with the person. You just have to believe, as people say, um, you know, political following is like taking a bus ride. It's not like getting married. You don't have to ha agree about, you know, riding off into the sunset together. All you want to do is take the bus that gets you closest to where you want to go. So changing the public conversation is incredibly important. Now, that being said, people say, why on earth isn't Merrick Garland doing something? And my answer to that remains the same. We don't know what he's doing. He has a reputation for holding his cards close to his vest and not um, talking about what he's doing. And I'm just going to hope that that's the case. And, and I don't know. I mean, the, the um, I think it's a mistake to kind of wait for a white knight to come save you, I'll tell you that. But it is a part of establishing democracy to make sure that things legally play out with all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And the great example of that comes out of Germany after World War II, when East Germany was convinced that it had to get every Nazi and did, um, sometimes on flim flimsy evidence. And West Germany made the decision to let a lot of Nazis go after the, the legal system did not properly convict them. So they would put these people up or decide not to because they felt they didn't have the evidence they needed. And of course that infuriated people, but what it did is it reestablished the rule of law, which is what democracies rest on. So that I suspect is at least part of what's going on with Garland and the Department of Justice. Now the Department of Justice has hired a huge number of lawyers be working on this case. And remember that they have dug through enormous amounts of material. So I suspect there is a lot more out there than we know about, but but we don't know. There's also, as I've talked about, how the low-hanging fruit is um, a way to put pressure on people higher up as you go because nobody knows what anybody else has got and that enables you to get better and better information out of more and more people is the plan. So that is in contrast to um, um, uh, so I'm sorry, somebody asked here about whether I thought the text messages between Mike Lee and Mark Meadows and, and Chip Roy would uh, result in prosecution. I have no idea. I mean, remember, there's a real difference between saying, oh, my God, we know this and actually having evidence that you can convince a jury of. So, for example, I've started writing tonight's letter. And, and one of the things that has come out, I don't know if you saw, but yesterday, it's actually quite sad. Yesterday, a lawyer for uh, one of the 11 conspirators, um, people who have been charged with conspiracy, 
insurrect, um, 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 seditious conspiracy in January 6th, his lawyers asked for him to be allowed out of prison um, before his trial. And it's actually quite a sad document. The the I mean, it's sad in that they try and and paint this guy who sounds like a like a real radical as being this sort of angel of sweetness and light. But it's also sad because it's clear that they really did think that they were doing something heroic. And you just think, like, how out of touch do you have to be to think that charging our capital is heroic? Anyway, um, what's interesting about that is in order to try and prove that it was not his client who was the problem, but rather uh, President Donald Trump and Stuart Rhodes, who's the leader of the Oath Keepers, that were the problem, the lawyer released a lot of text messages about the the um, uh, the days leading up to January 6th and during January 6th. And those text messages really indicate, and this is just, again, just low-hanging fruit, really low-hanging fruit, This the, these guys, um, that there was a lot of coordination between the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. And also, they talk about, now he doesn't answer, but they, they talk about being in contact with Roger Stone, who was a Trump advisor, um, and with uh, Ronnie Jackson, who was formerly the White House physician and who had just been elected as a, um, as a Congress critter from Texas. Ronnie Jackson came out, spokesperson came out today and said he had nothing to do with it. We don't know anything about this. But, you know, my name didn't show up in there. I'm sorry, I'm being flippant. But um, there's a lot there, and, and I think there's way more than we know. As I've said before, both Jamie Raskin, who is a representative from Maryland, and Liz Cheney, who's a representative from uh, from Wyoming, she's a Republican, he's a Democrat, have said that the material that the January 6th Well, certainly not sharing, but because they both have very good teams working together. And because we know a number of the people who have testified in front of the January 6th committee have said, boy, that's, you know, that's, you know, kind of the same thing I told the January 6th committee and everybody's ears sort of perked up and went, oh, I'm sorry, told the Department of Justice and their ears perked up and said, oh, you've talked to the Department of Justice. So I don't know what the answer is to that, but I don't think you have to worry about Garland doing nothing. Now, that being said, what is actually happening with the January 6th committee? And I made the point that the Department of Justice is looking at the legal side. The January 6th committee is looking at the, at the Congress needs to write new legislation. But the reality is what they are doing is they're keeping score and trying to piece together a map of what happened leading up to that insurrection. And that's what I'm watching, because while the prosecutions are important to me, aside from me as a person, to me as a historian, because one of the ways you break an authoritarian movement is you start to hold people to account, which didn't happen after the Civil War, by the way. And we've already had two, maybe it's three guilty verdicts of the people who participated in, the, in January 6th. And as I say, there's there's more people going up the chain. Um, holding people accountable matters in terms of breaking an authoritarian movement, but January, the January 6th committee is, I think, going to be enormously important because if we remember Watergate, no one cared about Watergate. They really didn't. I remember somebody complaining to me that their soap operas were not on TV and they had to watch these stupid hearings or that's all you, the option you had. This person obviously wasn't watching those hearings, but once the story started coming out, um, people snapped attention and recognized that this was a really important story. And my guess is that the committee will present it as an important story. And a lot of people have said, well, why didn't they hold these hearings live so we could see what was happening? And there's twofold answer to that. One is that you didn't want to tip off to other test uh, uh, witnesses what people had said. But two, come on, like it would have been boring unless you really love this stuff like like I do. There's a lot of listening to the same people say the same thing again and again and again. So one of the things that I thought was interesting is when the when the, uh, there's a big decision that dropped last night, as I mentioned, I sat down and read it because I love to read legal documents and to read political documents. Like, that's my happy place. Like, if you drop a document, I'm going to read it because it's fun to me. 
But how many people do that? Do you read political documents for fun? The answer is almost certainly no. So they didn't want to draw this out forever. What they're going to do is they're going to give us, I suspect, a very cleanly packaged, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And as you've seen on occasion when, for example, uh, one of the judges who um, said that Donald Trump, that John Eastman had to turn over his documents to the January 6th committee that involved President Trump. He laid out everything Trump had been doing in all those days. And even me, who'd spent a lot of time with that material, but it was like Trump was doing this and his son was doing this. And so it says, seeing Trump did this, 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 and this was like, whoa, even though I knew it, putting it all together like that was a real eye opener. So the January 6th committee is expecting now to do its presentation at the end of May or the beginning of June. I would not be surprised if that got pushed back for the simple reason that people like Eastman keep gumming up the wheels and saying, we're not going to turn over this material. And, and that's, you know, that's not fair. They're stopping us, the American people, from knowing what happened in our government. And so that's why the committee, if the committee isn't spinning its wheels, it's working phenomenally hard, like 16 hour days. But if they don't have the material, they don't have the, the material. All right, so I can't wait for that. I really can't wait for that. And it's very funny because a couple of my friends and I were talking about this. And unfortunately, because this timing keeps changing, um, they, somebody was like, I can't watch because those, those weeks that they're talking about, I've, are, I'm already committed. And the other person was complaining about that as well. And I'm like, I am so there. This is like a gift to be able to sit and watch these because I thought they were going to be in April when I was traveling. And the fact they've been put off is actually a very good thing for me. All right. So, um, why are we, uh, Okay, so, um, oh, another thing here. Interesting, let me just throw this out because it's interesting. Uh, last night, quite late, I read about this today. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene has been challenged by five members of her district against running in 2022 because under the third section of the 14th Amendment, if you've sworn an oath to the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection, you can't hold office. She tried to get that dismissed. Last night, a judge said you can't get it dismissed and it's going to go to hearings on Friday and she's supposed to testify in person under oath at 930 on Friday morning. This would be spectacular if it were really going to happen. I am afraid that it's probably going to get put off. I suspect there's no way on earth that woman wants to be the first person a congressperson to testify under oath about what happened to January 6th. But it's very interesting if it does because she's in trouble. Um, if, 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 you know, I was actually watching video clips of her today from Newsmax talking about how this was 1776 and all the kinds of stuff she said on January 5th. And, um, and if she gets into trouble, there are currently nine other cases around the country where people are challenging their Congress critters. And of course we had 146 Republican members of Congress who, um, who voted not to accept the certain states electoral college um, certificates and all of them I suspect would would be in trouble if this if in fact somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene is not able to move forward uh, with her candidacy in 2022. All right so a couple of things left people have asked what they can do and I've talked a ton about changing the narrative but of course there's going to be plenty more about that and you hear all the time the Democrats are going to lose in spades in the fall and remember that that um, people need narratives uh, newspapers need stories and there are many reasons to think that the Repu it's a very good year uh, structurally for Republicans but Um, Americans care about abortion rights at, at very high numbers. Even Republicans believe that Roe v. Wade should stay in place. So um, that's something that is not getting nearly the play that it ought to. There are an awful lot of people who believed that Roe v. Wade would never be challenged, who are now looking at the fact that women cannot make um, decisions over their own bodies in certain states right now. And other, other states are considering, for example, criminalizing leaving a state to ob obtain reproductive care. And that's, um,
stuff I could go into with abortion. You know I've done stuff on abortion before. And the recognition that if states can come for abortion, that simply means that they can come for anything that was decided under similar terms. And those are the terms that use the 14th Amendment to the Constitution to say that Americans have a right to equal protection under the laws in states. So states, for example, can't discriminate um, against gay people or Jews or any, you know, minority population, that they can't privilege Christianity, that uh, in fact people have a right to use contraception, which they were not able to do before the Supreme Court decided they could under the 14th Amendment, uh, that people can marry across gender lines and across race lines, which was not legal before the Supreme Court began to use that, uh, um, that uh, argument about equal protection under the laws and due process of the law. It's in the 14th Amendment. And that's, you know, you might not think you care at all about any one of those issues, but I promise you, you care a lot about one of those issues. And if they're all on the table, that that's really horrific. That would take us right back to the days of the 1920s and the 1930s, which were really times in which, you know, white men dominated everything. And that, of course, is, is part of the plan, not only because of the civil rights aspect of it, but also because that would wipe out government regulation of business. And that's really what started this whole thing to begin with in 1937, when people looked at the New Deal and said, people who didn't want government regulation looked at the New Deal and said, hey, doggies, we don't want this, we need to start a new political movement to stop it because it's so incredibly popular. That next question then is uh, is where to go with this. What else, why is the, the Biden administration speaking up more? I think, and I don't know, but I think the Biden administration is taking a page from psychologists, which says that if you, from what I read, I'm not trained as a psychologist, but I read psychology, um, that if you simply fight back against somebody, you are letting them control the narrative and control the space in which you are fighting. What the Biden administration keeps trying to do is do an end run around the Republicans and say, no, we're not going to talk about the latest idiocy out of Marjorie Taylor Greene. We're going to talk about jobs. We're going to talk about the Build Back Better project. We're going to talk about NATO. We're going to talk about all the ways in which we're moving the country forward. What they're running into, though, is terrible headwinds because the mainstream media keeps focusing on Trump and the crazies in the Republican Party. So it's a real problem for the Biden administration. And that's, I think, why they're doing what they're doing. I get it. I see it. But it's a real problem with the media being anchored the way it seems to be in the Trump narrative. So if changing the political conversation is one thing to do, here's another really big thing. And that is that yesterday there was an announcement from a group of Democrats uh, called, um, I'll find the name in just a second. I just called it up. Um, um, called clerk, clerk work, in which they are urging people to run for local office, primarily in um, election counting, in in making sure that the Republicans, which are making who are making a huge push under Steve Bannon to take over all the local election precincts, cannot do so, and that's uh, you know very basic doing election work, running for local offices, things that are um, uh, really things that a lot of us can do that are small ways, but hugely important ways to make sure that the next election is not going to be stolen. And if you have questions about that, volunteering, for example, for clerk work or for um, that, um, you, certainly there's a a website for that, but for lo for looking at how you can run for uh, for school board or how you can go to school board meetings and and stop the people who are being crazy, I urge you once again to turn to um, Red Wine and Blue, which has blueprints for that, or uh, the Suburban Woman Problem, which is a podcast, or to any of the many. Uh, voting rights and um, and getting involved organizations that are out there because the trick is you're only ineffectual and alone if you stay ineffectual and alone. The reality is the reason that the radical right is becoming so vicious and so outspoken and so hysterical is that they know they do not have the numbers they need. If they were in control, they would not need to speak up. And you see this again with people like Vladimir Putin, who had to suddenly pull all kinds of crap, like throwing Navalny in jail, his opponent Navalny in jail, and continually accusing him of more and more crimes to keep him 
happened there because Navalny was building such a big opposition to Putin's power. And again, if you had the control, you would not need to try and force it down everybody's throats the way they are. So deciding that we are helpless and deciding that we are going to lose and deciding that America has lost its democracy is a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I promise you, there are no statistics that say that that right-wing ideology is the one that is embraced by a majority of the American people. Our problem is that they have skewed our electoral system to the degree that we have absolutely got to address that, address the language, and address who's in those offices, or we will lose our democracy. All right, I hope that was useful, and I will uh, go back to writing, and I will see you Thursday, I believe it is. Thank you for being here.